Can we celebrate the goodness of our God this morning? You can go ahead and be seated. Well, good morning, church. My name's Reese. If we haven't met, I'm one of the pastors here at New Hope, and we're just thrilled that you're with us today. If you've been around for uh, the last weeks, you'll know we're in a sermon series called Killing What's Killing You. And we've been looking at different words in different weeks, and today we're looking at guilt. And I wanna tell you, uh, my desire is when you leave today, you'll leave with two truths. One, that life was never meant to be one long guilt trip but rather a journey of faith receiving God's grace. And number two, Jesus is the answer for your guilt. And I'm gonna try and show you just how much of an answer he is. And then we're gonna land the plane of our time coming around the Lord's table and celebrating communion together. Now, if you are... Joining us online this morning, you might wanna grab some bread and juice so you can be part of that, but uh, welcome. If you're at one of our campuses this morning, welcome to all of you. Your worship team and your campus pastor are gonna lead through that time around the Lord's table towards the end of our time, but we're glad that you're with us. Hey, maybe you're listening to my voice and you're not sure about where you're at in your spiritual journey, and so communion, Uh, maybe just kind of brings up some hesitation in you. If you would not yet self-identify as a Christian, then there's no pressure for you to take communion when we get to that partner service. Just uh, be welcome here. That's our deepest hope, that you just kind of feel welcome as you're on your journey. But we're really glad that you're here. So today we're talking about guilt. Guilt is this universal experience that... Everybody at some point has experienced the negative feelings associated with not doing what you ought to have done. No one has ever successfully erased that sense of ought which God wrote on every human soul. We know we have not done all that we ought to have done or felt all that we ought to have felt or said all that we ought to have felt and at some point, This made us aware of our wrong. The failure to do what we ought to have done is what we call guilt. Today I wanna explore two ways of dealing with our guilt. Two ways of dealing with this universal aspect of guilt and issue of guilt in our lives. First is unhealthy guilt. This is what drives avoidance and denial, and then the alternative is healthy guilt, which drives us and returns us to God's intended will for our lives. So let's jump into the text. I wanna be in uh, Hebrews 5 today, Hebrews chapter five. Before we jump in, did you know that uh, it's unknown who actually penned the book of Hebrews? Some scholars believe that Paul wrote it, some Luke, others Apollos, and then there's others that believe Priscilla uh, penned Hebrews. Now there's some controversy around uh, if the authorship was Priscilla because the name of the book would need to be changed from Hebrews to Shebrews. (laughs) All right, I got another one. We can confirm that coffee is served in heaven because of the book of Hebrews. Oh, these are really, really bad. That's enough, that's enough. Let's get back on track. (laughs) You know, if this is uploaded to YouTube, then that pathetic attempt at humor will be captured for the end of time, and I'm deeply regretting it right now. (laughs) All right, let's talk about this passage in chapter five. So the author is addressing a group of Christians who are stagnant in their faith. They've been Christians a long time and the writer is saying that they should be moving along in their faith by now and quite perplexed at the lack of spiritual progress. So listen, in Hebrews 5 verse 11, it says, there is much more we would like to say about this, but it's difficult to explain, especially since you are spiritually dull and don't seem to listen. 
You have been believers so long now that you ought to be teaching others. Instead, you need someone to teach you again the basic things about God's word. You are like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. For someone who lives on milk is still an infant and doesn't know how to do what is right. Solid food is for those who are mature, who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. You, you sense the drama in the text here, that the, 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 water, the calm waters are, are, are being stirred up. And this is a right interpretation of this text. Enter into the tension here. The author is frustrated that there's not more spiritual progress, that these people are just kind of stuck and stagnant in their faith. They're kind of like on a spiritual exorcer, if you will. I remember when uh, my wife and I uh, had our first child, Lily, uh, we didn't realize when uh, we got one of these exosources that it would be the greatest parenting purchase of our existence. <laughs> you see, our daughter loved to be in this for like hours. And see, the idea is they're able to move themselves on and, and they discover these toys and then they keep moving and oh, there's more toys on this side and around here and, and then there's other ones around here. And then here's the kicker. You move all the way around and my daughter would rediscover the same toys as if she'd never played with them before. Like seriously, she would spend hours in this thing. In fact, on some Friday nights, we would put her in it and then we would return Monday morning. <laughs> no, I'm only, I'm only joking. But I, I wanna etch this into your memories at the beginning of this message to think about this spiritual exorcist of going around and around and making the same mistakes. The author is basically saying that these early Christians were not moving on in their faith. They were discovering uh, confession and repentance and then moving to salvation in faith and then baptism and then on to prayer and eternal life and then going all the way back around as if they were discovering confession and repentance all over again and then faith in God and then baptism and prayer and eternal life and just continuing on and on the basics of the faith. And I wanna stir us this morning with this central metaphor that the writer is using in Hebrews. They use this metaphor of food and illustrations and metaphors uh, throughout all of scripture are to help us understand through comparisons the values of the kingdom of heaven, of God's kingdom, and how we understand them and live them out here on earth. And the writer here is, is bringing this illustration that there's a, a basic beginning, an elementary aspect to our faith that's like drinking only milk. And they're calling us to move on and to be aware that we're not meant to just stay with drinking milk but we're to move on in our faith, to take on a deeper understanding and move on to spiritual, solid food. You see, when you drink milk, it, it, it satisfies you for a moment. You see, it'll, it'll line your stomach and send false messages to the brain that you're satisfied. That's what it's like just drinking milk. In our Western ways, in our Western culture, when it comes to guilt, we tend to be on a guilt exorcist, going over and over the same things round and round again in the attempt to deal with our guilt. And I want you to relate this morning. What is the kind of guilt exorcist that you've been on that keeps you drinking milk and not moving on? with dealing with your guilt. Three predominant ways in our Western culture. The first way is intellectual ways. This is the belief that you can think your way out of feelings of guilt. This way you make mental arguments, the fact that you've placed too much unrealistic expectations on yourself. Give yourself a break, you're only human. It's unreasonable to expect more. So basically, 
You justify lowering your expectations so that this way you feel less guilt. Another argument is to say that the moral principles are outdated and the restrictions are just not relevant in today's day and age. You solve your guilt problem by coming out of the dark ages and into the 21st century. Want less guilt in your life? Then simply take the needle of your moral compass and move it to 2021. It's far less restrictive in 2021. This is how you can approach it with an intellectual way or make a mental argument of comparison. You're not as bad as that person. Therefore, you don't have to measure up to anybody. You don't fall short of some imaginary standard. And therefore, you've solved your guilt problem with an intellectual argument. Thinking you can successfully remove guilt in your life this way is like drinking only milk. The next unhealthy way that we tend to repeat on a guilt exorcer of our life is physical ways. This is one of the most deceptive attempts to escape feelings of guilt. Avoidance in hopes that they'll disappear. To pursue denial over stimulation and over entertainment of all and any kind of distraction. Be that by binging on Netflix or compulsive gaming or overly busy social calendar where you're out every night, at work every day, and you make a conscious decision to have people around you all the time. There's always the constant barrage of a Sonos playing music or a podcast in the background of your life and you've devoted yourself to activity all the time. Never be unsettled by silence. Never stop, never slow down, never be quiet. The other giant in this physical category is the avoidance by intoxication. When overcome by feelings of guilt, you can always fall back on drugs and alcohol. We often incorrectly label our justification by drinking by issues like stress or grief or loneliness, but the root is always a growing sense of guilt that's wanting to be drowned out. Now, it's not without a sense of grace that I say this, it's true. The bottle will never make things better. The bottle will never make things better. The root is always a growing sense that you're wanting to drown out guilt. Any attempt to remove guilt by physical ways will always fall short. It's kinda like drinking only milk. The last unhealthy way that we attempt to deal with guilt may surprise you, especially after talking about alcohol. It's religious ways. This is perhaps the oldest and most revered tactic for avoiding the misery of guilt, religion. This way is the most deceptive because it comes closer to the answer for guilt. What intellectual and physical ways generally overlook is the ultimate cause and the root of guilt is there is a righteous and holy God whose will for his creation is being ignored and being disregarded. The means that religion has developed to deal with guilt is attempting to placate or appease God with good deeds and religious rituals. To be fooled into this notion that a debt of one's wrongdoing can be removed and paid back through good works and religious duties is a monumental mistake. The falsehood of dedicating one's life to religious activities in the hopes that they will deliver a reprieve from the depth of guilt is simply ineffective. It's completely inadequate method and strategy. Friends, let me say it plainly. Religious practices cannot remove or compensate for your guilt. Believing that your church attendance or Bible reading or being baptized or taking Holy Communion is what makes you right before a just and righteous and holy God is kinda like drinking only milk. And we end up living in a constant guilt exorcer, 
going around, to making mental arguments, to moving our moral compass, intellectual ways to deal with it, moving on to physical ways where we keep ourselves so occupied that we never slow down. Or we go to the bottle and we just say, tonight, I just need to dull out the sense of the guilt in my life. And then we move on to religious ways because then comes Sunday. We don't change our behaviour. We just come here on Sunday and give God an hour and a half of our time and appease the sense of guilt in our life. And we go round and round and round on the guilt exercise. And we've been called to move on from milk. Some translations say to move on to spiritual meat. Some of you are wondering if I was gonna turn that steak. Verse 13 tells us a person who is living on milk isn't very far along in the Christian life. A person who is living on milk isn't very far along in the Christian life. You're called from the guilt exorcer, from, from just drinking only milk to move on to a deeper understanding of the gospel. See, once you've grasped the healthy way of dealing with your guilt, every other way will seem thin and superficial and utterly inadequate by comparison. And you can't help but live a changed life because Jesus is the answer for your guilt. Jesus is the only way to remove guilt. Did you catch that? Jesus is the only way to remove guilt. Want me to prove it to you? Go to Romans chapter three, verse 19. Obviously, the law applies to those to whom it was given, for its purpose is to keep people from having excuses and to show that the entire world is guilty before God. For no one can can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law, as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes. Listen to this, no matter who we are, for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard Yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus and when he freed us from the penalty for our sins, for God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. Now down to verse 27. Can we boast then that we have done anything to be accepted by God? anything on the guilt exorcer that works? Is there anything that works? No, because our acquittal is not based on obeying the law, it is based on faith. See, Scripture is not meant to stop at information. It's not meant for us to consume it and just stay like we're drinking only milk. It's meant to transform our lives, to move us from a guilt exorcer into understanding the depth of consuming a more mature spiritual meat. Because if you drink only milk, you're you're very early on, you're like an infant that is falsely being satisfied and not progressing. Let me give you some challenge. We are meant to be progressing in our understanding of the gospel, progressing past the guilt exorcer that we go to an intellectual way and a physical way and religious ways over and over again. We're meant to move on to know that Jesus is the only way to remove guilt. The only way. 
And when we obey the voice of the Holy Spirit and his conviction in our lives, our guilt is gone and replaced with peace and happiness and we've returned to God's intended plan for our lives. In Steve Poe's book, Creatures of Habit, he outlines three areas for us to grow in maturity and how to move to spiritual meat when it comes to guilt in our lives. The first thing Steve says is to own it, to acknowledge it, to own our guilt, to acknowledge it. Proverbs 28, 13 says, people who conceal their sins will not prosper, but if they confess and turn from them, they'll receive mercy. Remember that healthy guilt is the voice of the Holy Spirit whispering, surrender and return to grace. Too often people walk away from God. Christians walk away from their faith because they cannot handle the unaddressed guilt plaguing their lives. This is not God's intention in giving Jesus to deal with our guilt. The second healthy habit to develop in our life is to accept God's forgiveness. When we struggle with guilt, we we believe we don't deserve forgiveness. Friends, no one deserves forgiveness. It's a gift. God gave us the gift. And if you are not convinced that God can and will forgive you, then you're prone to feelings of self-punishment and you hold an inaccurate image of the God who loves you. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. Sipo writes in his book, there is one thing you'll never hear God say, I remember what you did 10 years ago. No, God said, it is forgiven and it is forgotten. The third healthy habit is to forgive yourself. Pastor Charles Stanley once said, forgiveness is never complete until first, we have the forgiveness of God. Second, we can forgive others who have wronged us. And third, we're able to forgive ourselves. To forgive yourself means let it go, let it go. Like that really annoying song, let it go, let it go, can hold you back anymore. I know what you're thinking. (laughs) Reese, will you sing us another Disney song? I'm not gonna do that. But some of you are beating yourself up about something you did 10 years ago. And that's why the last movement is to understand that you've been forgiven and forgotten when you confess and repent before a holy God. He has made a way where Jesus will remove your guilt. You need to let it go. You need to stop beating yourself up and looking at some guilt stain in your life, believing that that Jesus can't cleanse that. And so you stay feeling this guilt in your life. An old Jewish scholar put it like this. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past. Listen to me, some of you need to hear this. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us. Listen friends, it's never too late. See, we serve the God of the second and third and fourth chances. Don't spend your life feeling guilty about past mistakes. You can't go back. You can't go back, but you can begin to start a brand new end. Can you smell that? There's an odor 
to guilt. And there's a fragrance to forgiveness. Listen to this, 2 Corinthians 2, 14. But thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumphant procession in Christ and through us, through us, spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of Him. For we are to God, for we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved, those who are perishing. Let me ask you this morning, those that are around your life, your friends, your family, your co-workers, fellow students, those people that God has crossed your paths, do, do they experience an odour of your guilt stains? Or do they experience the fragrance of forgiveness? You see, the, the fragrance of forgiveness makes us hunger after the things of God. Is your life causing people around you to hunger after the hope that you've found in Jesus Christ? Or are you spending time on a, on a guilt or exorcist or going around and around and around and there's this odour, this odour of guilt. We, we are meant to spread everywhere the fragrance of forgiveness. Isn't that cool? The fragrance of forgiveness is spread everywhere through us. And to God, we are the aroma of Christ to those who are being saved and to those who are perishing. We are called to be people who have received forgiveness in such fullness and completeness in our lives that there's a fragrance that comes away from us. It's a fragrance of forgiveness on your life. And people are hungry for the hope that you have in Jesus Christ. For we live in a time where people are constantly trying to find ways to deal with their guilt and nothing ever works and nothing removes guilt. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. It's Jesus who carries us to the table of grace and mercy. At this point, I want to release our campuses to your worship team and to your campus pastors to take you to the Lord's table and to celebrate communion together. So, grace and peace, friends. Now I wanna invite you to lean forward and in the chair in front of you, you'll see the communion elements. If you would take them and please stand to your feet with me. These are vacuum sealed COVID conscious communion. <laughs> so with a bit of muscle, you're gonna have to peel off the first seal and it'll reveal a wafer. And then the second seal will replace the juice and I'll lead us through taking this in a moment, but if you would stand to your feet with me. See, Jesus carries us to the table. Our guilt is removed, not via intellectual or physical or religious ways, but by the grace found in Jesus Christ, by the grace of the one who lived a perfect life, and died on a cruel Roman cross and was buried and on the third day rose victorious so that He could carry us to the table of the Lord. And at the table of the Lord, there is your name, a place reserved for you, a place reserved that is free from guilt, remorse, regret and shame where you get to sit and be clothed under grace and mercy because it is Jesus who removes your guilt. And then He carries you to the table of the Lord. In Zephaniah 3.17, it says that God so delights in you, His son and daughter, that He sings over you 
And so we've asked the worship team, if I take a few moments right now just to sing over you, just to be in this atmosphere. Some of you have been beating yourself up for a long time over a past mistake. And today you've come to a realisation that that's just like drinking milk and not moving on to spiritual meat, the the maturity and understanding of the Gospel, that Jesus paid for it once and for all, that Jesus is the answer for your guilt. How much of an answer? He is the complete, the totality, all-encompassing. It is finished, done with. It's so complete that Jesus removes your guilt that it costs for yesterday, today and tomorrow. It covers your past. It covers what you're beating yourself up about 10 years ago. It covers the mistakes that you'll make today and it covers the mistakes you'll make tomorrow. You hold in your hands. It represents the body and the blood of Jesus. You hold in your hand the one who carries you to the table of the Lord because of His grace. So now, let the team minister and remember that your heavenly Father is singing over you grace upon grace.
on the night Jesus was betrayed, He sat at a meal with His first followers and He interrupted the time by taking the bread and He asked His Father in heaven to bless it. And then He declared, this is my body broken for you. When you eat this, remember me. So let us eat and remember. That same meal, Jesus took the cup and He declared to His first followers that this is my blood freely shed for the remission of your sin. The power of this blood ushers in a new covenant, a new promise between God and His people. When you, remember, when you drink this, remember me. So let us drink and remember. God, we remember that You didn't hold back Your most treasured, but You gave Jesus. You gave Jesus to be beaten and broken for us, to shed freely His blood that we may have our guilt washed away that we may be found right to a righteous God. Penned by a pastor 50 years ago, it's the words, Jesus is precious because He takes away our guilt. And we remember that Jesus, You died in our place, that we celebrate You, Jesus, because You carry us to grace and mercy. We celebrate You, Jesus, because the power of Your blood carries us to the table. We celebrate You, Jesus, because You carry us to the table of the Lord. God, you can. 